Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 82. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and it's wonderful to have your company. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron, and thank everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. Your support and encouragement are very much appreciated. If you love the podcast and never miss an episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. It's easy to do. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron only monthly giveaways. July's prizes and Anne Boleyn cushion from Hever Castle. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about women and family in Tudor England is Dr. Nicola Clark. Dr. Clark is a senior lecturer in early modern history at the University of Chichester. Her first book, Gender, Family and Politics, The Howard Women, was published by Oxford University Press in 2018. And she also writes for public audiences with work featured in History Today and on the History Extra website. She has spoken about her research at events for historic royal palaces, the National Archives, various schools and academic institutions, and was the historical research specialist for the 2016 BBC One docudrama Six Wives, presented by Lucy Worsley. Nicola was awarded her first degree in English and American Literature and History from the University of Kent in 2007 and then moved to Royal Holloway College, University of London, where she passed her MA with distinction in 2008. She remained there to undertake her PhD in early modern history with a thesis on five women of the Howard family. The Howards were the preeminent noble dynasty in the period, and her work reveals for the first time the many ways in which the Howard women were involved in their family's political successes and failures. She argues that women were integral to noble families' fortunes, but that contrary to popular and scholarly belief, there was not often an identifiable family strategy for collective action or survival. Before coming to Chichester, Nicola taught at the University of Winchester and Royal Holloway College, University of London. She's published widely on women's roles, queenship, the Reformation and Tudor politics. My conversation with Nicola straight after this musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. (laughs) 
welcome to Talking Tudors. Nikki, how are you? Hi, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Fantastic. Now, I thought we could just begin by you just introducing yourself and just telling us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I'm Nikki Clark. I'm a senior lecturer in early modern history, sometimes also late medieval history at the University of Chichester. I write about women, usually elite women in early Tudor England. Uh, I did my first degree at the University of Kent in English and history. Uh, and then I moved to Royal Holloway College at the University of London to do an MA and stayed there to do my PhD. Uh, and I did that on the women of the Howard family. And I, I thought about them as a family. How far were the women involved in their family's successes and their family's failures? Things like that. Uh, I now teach at the University of Chichester, as I said. I have also taught at Winchester and at Royal Holloway as well uh, and published things about women's roles, queenship, the Reformation, Tudor politics, that sort of thing. Fantastic. And and I want to just ask you about the book that you've written. So it's called Gender, Family and Politics, the Howard Women, as you mentioned. So what could you tell us a little bit more about it and also what drew you to the Howard Women? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the book came out in 2018. It's an academic book. So yeah, it, it sometimes gets a bit involved, but I hope it's readable as well. I knew from the start of my research that I wanted to look at women at court during this period. I spent my whole teenage years reading history books, internally hollering, but where are all the girls? <laughs> but I knew I didn't want to replicate what had already been done. Uh, and some people had already begun to research this kind of thing. So I did a ton of reading, a ton of research, and I started to notice that the name Howard was popping up a lot. Two of Henry VIII's wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, were related to the Howard dynasty. Uh, a lot of other women with different surnames also turn out to have been related to the wider dynasty. So it's like one huge family web all over the Tudor court. So at that point, I drew a massive family tree, including all the women on, I don't know, something huge like A2 paper. And then I put a red dot next to everyone who got executed for treason, <laughs> sat back and thought, ha, huh, there's something there. And I realised that nobody had really thought about what the other Howard women around those Tudor queens were doing. And that we just assumed that the whole dynasty was acting like one big happy family gunning towards the same goals. And I wanted to see if that was true. And that's really what the book is about. Um, the chapters are thematic. So there's a chapter on kinship and one on marriage and, and a whole chapter on treason, which really tells you most of what you need to know about those women. Yeah, it sounds intriguing. And I love making all those connections because they're, they're sometimes they're quite surprising connections. That, you know, you've been studying it for a long time and you didn't realise that this person was related to the other person. So it's all, it's quite fascinating. Now, Nikki, we're going to be talking about women and family in Tudor England, but obviously this is a huge topic and status obviously affected women's experiences. So I'd really love to focus on aristocratic women for today's episode. But before we dive in, during the 16th century, what were the common assumptions about females and female nature in general? Well, a long story short, women were secondary. They were subordinate to men. That is the general assumption about women and female nature in the 16th century. That view of women is predicated on, on two major things, the medical understanding of gender and a religious view as well. So medically speaking, society tended to follow ancient models of understanding the human body, like the humoral system that had been outlined by the Greek philosopher Galen way back when. Um, and that's the one with the four humours, cold, wet, dry and hot, that are allied to four kinds of uh, disgusting bodily fluids, so blood and phlegm and black bile and yellow bile. For the body to be healthy, it was thought that the humours needed to be balanced. But this also has gendered connotations. So women were thought to be cold and wet. Men were hot and dry. So men went to war and had sex a lot. And women were weaker and cried a lot. Religiously speaking, the view of women followed the Bible. And Eve was the major model. So women were temptresses. They were not to be trusted. They were weaker. And they were more likely to succumb themselves to temptation. Um, now, I'm not saying that every single person on the street would have rattled that off if you'd asked them, but this is the kind of stuff that underlies general societal understandings of female nature. And that underpins things like the law, where women are basically treated as second class citizens. But on the other hand, 
status also plays a role. So if we're talking about elite women, as we are, yes, they are subordinate to elite men. But if you are, for instance, a male servant of an aristocratic woman, it's not likely that you'd be stupid enough to try and order her around, for instance. So there are various factors that, that play into how these things actually worked on the ground. Now, at the time, parents were expected to raise their daughters to become chaste and obedient women, and of course, to teach them to perform all the roles expected of a wife. So in light of this, what sort of education did girls receive? Actually, you've hit the nail on the head there. People in general were educated to fit them for the life that they were intended to lead as adults. And that's the case for men as well as women. So for elite women during this period, that does usually mean a less uh, what we might call scholarly education than an elite man would receive. So most aristocratic girls are not taught Greek or Latin or rhetoric or philosophy or, you know, scholarly things like that. At an early age, they would get the rudiments of basic education, probably from their mothers. So things like initial religious instruction, uh, learning the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments, things like that. They might well be taught to read also by their mother, presuming that she could. And most elite women could at least read by this point, even if writing was sometimes a bit shaky. They would also learn to sew. As girls got older, it's it's probable that she would shadow her mother and learn household and estate management that way. Managing some of these huge aristocratic estates is a bit like managing a huge business corporation, like a massive hotel or something like that, and making sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so it's quite an undertaking. And the best way to learn that is is to follow someone who's doing it. It was also quite common in elite families for children to get sent away to be fostered by another noble household, usually in their very early teens, because that's a way for that child to learn social graces, make connections that are going to help them in later life, polish their attainments and things like that. And this is the case for girls as well as boys. So a few girls might also end up at the royal court for pretty much the same purpose as maids of honour in service with the queen. Again, that's a kind of finishing school process under the supervision of the mother of the maids. Um, there were a few aristocratic girls, particularly as the 16th century wore on, that did receive what we might think of as a more male kind of education. So women like, for instance, the princesses, Mary and Elizabeth, uh, Lady Jane Grey, the Cook sisters, there's a great book about them by Gemma Allen. Um, they did receive the kind of education where they learned Greek and Latin and a zillion other languages and things like that. But that's not the norm yet during this period. You know, there are so many arranged marriages. I think most for the ar aristocratic people were arranged marriages. So what factors did parents take into consideration when they were kind of picking a spouse for their daughter? And I'm really interested to know, did women actually have any say in the matter? And what were the sort of main goals uh, seen as for marriage? Yeah, again, it's quite a case by case basis. But as a general rule for elite women, marriage is pretty much an economic contract between the families of the bride and the groom. So whether she gets any say in that really depends on the attitudes of the people around her. Um, but the economics of it for elite families is probably the number one consideration woven in with social status. So the woman would bring a dowry with her. And by this this time, it's most usually cash. Uh, but if she's an heiress, it might be land. In return, the groom's family would assign her what was called a jointure, which meant a parcel of land and the income of that was there to support her if her new spouse died before she did, which was quite common. Um, and the amounts of those two sums, the dowry and the jointure, tended to be adjusted up and down depending on the specific aims and the social status of the two parties involved. So if a bride is much, much higher status than her intended groom, the groom's family might then offer a higher jointure and she might bring less dowry, almost because her status is part and parcel of what they're getting and what they're paying for. And that doesn't mean that women had no say in the matter whatsoever. There is some evidence that, you know, people were aware that it wasn't a good idea to try and force two young people together if they hated each other. But often two intended spouses might not know each other that well or even at all before they do marry. And generally, young women are expected to abide by the wishes of their parents or their guardians in terms of who they marry. Um, but I don't know. I, I think it's easy to see that as very oppositional um, in the, the woman against her parents. You know, they won't let her marry who she loves. Occasionally that happens. But generally speaking, it's not that way. The things that 
that her parents want for her, so things like financial security and status, are the things that she also wants for herself, because they're the biggest things that are going to make her future life worth living. I don't think people expect romantic love in the way that we do now. There's no kind of sense of Mr. Right. Um, and again, that's not to say that that doesn't happen. It sometimes does. Um, I mean, Anne Boleyn's sister Mary ran off with William Stafford, and that was yes. that was a love match. Um, but but that's the thing. Often it happens with subsequent marriages rather than the first marriage, because once you've married once to please your family, you're a bit freer to follow your own inclinations the next time around. Yeah, that's so interesting. Actually, the you mentioned uh, Mary Boleyn because the the letter that she wrote to Thomas Cromwell asking basically for him to intercede with her with her family that were all very very cranky at her for having married below her station and without Anne's permission is quite an amazing letter. She and she basically says yeah she did it for love which is not the not the norm at that time so that's really interesting. Now once a woman got married, what were her legal rights? Was she better or worse off than say a single woman or a widow? Again, hard to give a one size fits all answer. Um, experiences of marriage uh, and of widowhood could be really variable at this point. More commonly, though, married women are legally worse off, certainly than widows in certain kinds of law. So when a woman marries, she moves from the household of her father to the household of her husband. But legally, she also now becomes the possession of her husband. She becomes his chattel. And that means that legally her status is subsumed into his. It's covered by his status. And that's called coverture. And that means that in, in common law, in secular law, she doesn't exist as an individual in the eyes of that law. That means that a married woman can't own property, can't administer property at law, can't bring or fight a lawsuit or make a will in her own name. She has to get her husband or a male relative to act for her. And sometimes that's a massive pain. Uh, in church law, though, in canon law, coverture is not a thing. Married women did exist, but that doesn't necessarily get them all that far because gender bias is pretty explicit at that point. Widows, on the other hand, aren't subject to coverture. Once you're widowed, you exist. Ta-da! Right. <laughs> so you'll see many more widows in legal records. Women, widows are able to act for themselves and do all those things that married women can't do, uh, which does give them a lot more freedom. In contemporary eyes, what did a successful marriage look like? You've kind of touched on this, but I want to sort of delve deeper into what role did love play, if any? Sure. Um, I think, generally speaking, a successful marriage... If you asked a contemporary woman, you know, what do you want out of marriage? I think most of them would have said that they wanted what we might call companionate marriage. So they expect to get on all right, hopefully to have kids, to work as a team. Again, yes, women are secondary to men, but in practice on the ground, you kind of need each other if you're going to run a huge aristocratic estate successfully um, and you each need to pull your weight. So I think that they expect that they'll help one another out, that they'll get on. Maybe they'll develop love. That does happen. And yeah, love does play a role. It's it's really common. I don't have the statistics at the top of my head, but Barbara Harris has done some research looking at um, tons of, of wills of aristocratic men and women between 1450 and 1550. Um, and there's hundreds of these. And she did some analysis that showed that the vast majority of men who died leaving a wife still alive made that wife their executor, which means the person who carried out the will, their last wishes. You don't do that unless you trust somebody to do what you want. And the fact that so many of them did does suggest that some degree of, of love and trust played a role in most marriages. And how did women... Um, engage with the political sphere at the time? Well, it used to be thought that they just didn't, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then a historian called Barbara Harris pointed out that an awful lot of the things that elite women did that have been characterised as domestic things, things like bringing up children, arranging marriages, managing estates, uh, offering hospitality, giving gifts, things like that, were all about forming and maintaining networks with other noble individuals. We know separately that that's pretty much how politics works at this time. It's all about who you know, how well you know them, how much they like you, things like that. Therefore means, realistically, that all of those things should be conceptualised as political activity. And suddenly when you do that, you start seeing women everywhere. Who gave somebody a gift that made them look favourably on you so that they did what you wanted them to do? Oh, it was so-and-so's wife, things like that. Um, so Alwyn Houghton has described 
elite women as the oil on the wheels of the patronage system. And I really like that phrase because it, it's soft power. It's behind the scenes. And that sometimes means that it's harder to see in written records. But it's absolutely there. And they are doing all these things and engaging with the political sphere in that way. Yeah, and I think the gift giving is is a fascinating area to research, definitely. Now, you, you talked about the fact that obviously aristocratic women very often managed really large households. And as the men were often away on business, this provided them with some freedom and allowed them to exercise power and authority. It also gave women the chance and space to cultivate and foster those female networks. So how important were these female ties for women at the time? They're super important. But again, they're often hard to see in surviving sources. Things only survive if there was a reason to keep them by and large or sometimes by quirks of fate. So you keep letters if they happen to be all collected together and left in a loft or if they're seized because somebody got accused of treason and things like that. But female ties are harder to see in formal legal documents uh, or deeds to houses and things like that. But they were important and they were a thing. So every elite woman has a small group of women around her, serving her as ladies in waiting and as maids, keeping her company, things like that. And they tend to move about like a little band within the household. So they're together a lot of the time and they form really strong relationships. And you can see this in things like Catherine Howard's rise to become Henry's fifth wife, in that once she'd done that, once she'd married Henry VIII, she then gave places in her household as queen to several of the young women who'd lived with her in her previous households, which Again, it shows that they're quite canny and they know very well that if one of them does well, they'll all come out of the woodwork and start demanding things. Um, But it does also show that strong friendships and bonds were made. We also know that women will visit each other. So when the Duke of Norfolk is away from his home in the mid 1520s, his wife Elizabeth is visited by a small group of women that she knew from her service at court. And there's no other reason for them to have come all the way out to East Anglia which is not a, a, sh- a short journey at that time, um, other than to see her and to maintain those connections. And women also look out for each other in tricky situations. So the same Elizabeth, the Duchess of Norfolk, shelters her sister-in-law, the Countess of Oxford, when she's dealing with a really difficult marital situation. We can see from household accounts that the Countess comes to stay for quite a number of weeks just at that point. And another uh, situation where we find women coming together is obviously childbirth. So could you talk to us a little bit about women's experiences as mothers, maybe uh, touching on, you know, pregnancy and childbirth as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, that's women's primary purpose, really. Elite women, particularly at this time, they were supposed to breed and continue the dynastic line. So a lot of elite women spend a lot of time being pregnant, which can't have been the biggest amount of fun. What they tend to do is to keep going more or less with their normal lives until about a month before the estimated due date. And that is an estimation. Sometimes they're wrong because the only means that they have to know whether they've conceived a child um, was that menstruation would stop. But even they know that that is not a wholly reliable sign. So mistakes are sometimes made and things like that. Um, But at that point, an elite woman would normally withdraw into confinement, which is also often called the lying in period. And she usually does that in her own home or maybe with a female relative, sometimes with her mother. And we actually know more about this for queens than we do for other women because there are royal ordinances that survive that were written down by Margaret Beaufort in the late 1490s uh, that lay out exactly how this happened, what the space for confinement was supposed to look like. So what the Queen does is withdraw into a set of chambers away from the rest of the court. And those rooms have been made dark. There are hangings around with sort of non-stressful topics depicted because you don't want to stress out the mum. It needs to be warm. There's probably a fire. There's at least one bed. uh, And the whole area is served only by women. No men are allowed in. So it's really a space for her to rest before she gives birth and she'll stay there until she does give birth. Birth itself is dangerous, everybody knew that, and it isn't necessarily less dangerous for elite women than it would be for poorer women, except that elite women are undoubtedly better nourished nutritionally than poorer women, and that might well make a difference. Um, But it has been suggested that really elite women, especially queens, might in some ways be worse off during the actual birth itself because they tend to be attended by surgeons, by doctors, male doctors, rather than midwives. Now, in this period, the chances of a doctor knowing an awful lot about female anatomy or childbirth 
is reasonably slim. What you want, really, is a midwife who's helped plenty of women give birth before. Now, the Queen does have a midwife, but she doesn't have the same collection of neighbourhood women around her who would have done this before. So it has been suggested that if something went wrong, actually a surgeon wouldn't have a huge amount of idea what to do, whereas a midwife would. So in some ways, a queen might be in a little bit more danger. After the birth, presuming all goes well, an elite woman will stay where she is for 40 days. During that time, the child's normally christened. And then at the end of that 40 days, she undergoes a ceremony of churching, where she goes to the church and is blessed. Um, and this purifies her and welcomes her back into the community. And then she can leave her chamber. And Natalie Zeman Davis has argued that for some households where they were able to do this, in some ways that reverses the normal household hierarchy, because rather than the man being at the top of the house, his every whim catered to, suddenly a woman is the one resting and the man has to do her work and do what, what she wants to do. And she's the one to be considered, which I think is really interesting. And then once the child is born, usually for elite women, a wet nurse is hired. They don't usually feed their babies themselves. And that's, that's partly because she can conceive again faster if she's not breastfeeding. We know that forms a bit of a natural contraceptive otherwise. She can return to service at court, pick up her normal duties, whatever it is she normally does. Choosing a wet nurse could be quite difficult as well. There is evidence that women were quite picky about who they chose to nurse their children, not surprisingly. Queen Elizabeth of York's privy purse expenses show that leading up to the birth of uh, the birth of the child that killed her, I want to say it's Catherine, I could be wrong, in 1502-3, there's a number of entries in the chamber books uh, paying the expenses of women who'd come to see her to have been her nurse, but have been sent away again because she didn't choose that one. So it does show she's quite picky. There would also be nursery staff. Um, so yeah, in terms of how much contact mothers would have with their children, it's really, really variable. It depends how much that woman is at home. Uh, or not. I mean, yes, there's a nursery staff, but that's partly because elite women, although we think of them as sitting around all day, they're really not. They're busy people. They can't realistically delegate a lot of their estate duties to somebody else. So it does make sense to have staff to look after your child. And it's a status thing as well. It's a look how rich I am. I don't have to breastfeed, you know, that sort of thing. And so if we asked a Tudor elite woman, you know, what's a good mother? What, what's a good mother look like, act like, behave like? What sort of things do you think they'd say? I think they would say a good mother is one who gave her children the tools that they needed to survive in the elite world. So a mother who gives them the right rudiments of knowledge, manners, religion, skills, social contact, things like that. When it comes to the ties that mothers developed with their children, there appears to be a sort of prevalent view, and I know I've seen it a lot in comments on social media and that sort of thing, that mothers didn't love their children as deeply as we do today. And I think this view sort of stems from the fact that, as you've already mentioned, royal and aristocratic mothers delegated much of their infant sort of everyday routine care to servants, you know, wet nurses. They often had to travel and they left their children behind. And if we're talking about royalty, they even had separate households for like little babies. So virtually from birth. So in your opinion, do you think mothers developed a strong, loving bond with their children? Yes, I think they often did. Um, that view that, you know, parents didn't love their children in pre-modern times. Um, and it used to be argued that this was because child mortality was so much higher that um, parents didn't didn't sort of bother to emotionally invest in their children because they might die anyway. It is true that child mortality was high. Uh, Agnes, Duchess of Norfolk, gave birth to 12 children, six of whom survived to adulthood. I mean, that's not a great a great ratio, really. And she is as elite as they get. So it's not a you know, it, it's not that she hasn't got every advantage to help her children survive. It's, it's a thing that happens during this period. But to imagine that they didn't feel grief when children died, I mean, that's that's definitely erroneous. We know that mothers were heartbroken when children died. I mean, Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, when Prince Henry died unexpectedly in 1511, we know they were, they were devastated. We know that Henry VII and Elizabeth of York um, were devastated when Prince Arthur dies. Uh, when the news was brought to them, there's a great Herald's account that shows Elizabeth of York trying to comfort Henry VII and saying, now oh, look, yeah, this is awful, but we're young yet, you know, we can have another child sort of thing. Um, and then she went back to her chambers and then she fell apart 
and he came and comforted her. So absolutely, people did care about their children a lot. Uh, Catherine of Aragon cared a lot about Princess Mary. One of one of the things she most desperately wanted to do during the period where she was banished from court in the early 1530s was to see her daughter. And uh, it was one of Henry VIII's greatest cruelties not to allow that to happen. So, yeah, I think mothers definitely do develop these strong bonds, loving bonds with their children during this period. I have always found that strange when people sort of comment, oh, no, they didn't. <laughs> she didn't love her or I the last comment I read was about Anne Boleyn. No, she didn't, you know, she didn't have a close bond with Elizabeth. And I, I find that very odd. But anyway, all right. So in her book, <laughs> English Aristocratic Women, Barbara Harris, who you've mentioned earlier, states that despite patriarchal institutions and the expectations, aristocratic women did manage, and this is her quote, to set their own agendas and gain considerable freedom in their daily lives. So do you agree with this view? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think it's wrong to say that women are trying to overturn patriarchy during this period. We also can't use the word feminist to describe them. These women are not seeking equality as we would describe it. But what they do is they work with and around that system. And I think the system is often more flexible than perhaps we assume. It is possible for women to do what they wanted to do within certain parameters. But I mean, not every man could do what they wanted to do either. Uh, there were points in writing this book about the Howard women where, believe it or not, I actually felt slightly sorry for Thomas Howard, third Duke of Norfolk, <laughs> which is hard to do because That's I think hard most to people believe. Agree. <laughs> it's hard to believe, isn't it? Because he's, he's really not the nicest of men. He's not. But there are times when he is in such a difficult position and the women of his, of his family really don't make this any easier. Uh, so his daughter, Mary, who marries Henry VIII's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond. So she becomes Mary Fitzroy, Duchess of Richmond. She's she's at the Tudor court serving Anne Boleyn. She's best mates with Henry's niece, Margaret Douglas. Um, and she's one of the main contributors to the Devonshire manuscript of poetry that they're passing around their little glittering court circle. Um, and she's also all over Hilary Mantel's latest novel, which I love, uh, which is great. But yeah, Mary's awesome. Mary marries the first time to please her family and that's fine but she's unexpectedly widowed in 1536 at the age of 16 17 something like that at that point she starts essentially a battle with henry the eighth to claim her jointure because henry the eighth says the marriage wasn't consummated i don't owe you squat right. and she says actually i think you do and she consults lawyers she consults her counsel as a noblewoman, which she would have had. She badges her father, the Duke of Norfolk, endlessly to let her go to London, go to court and sue to the king herself and get him to do what she wants. And Thomas Howard is obviously a little bit nervous about this because you don't just march up to the king and tell him to do something, you know, that that way madness lies. So I think he's a bit like, now, hang on, we need to wait till Thomas Cromwell says it's OK. And she's not having any. He says in one of his letters that with weeping and wailing, she keeps demanding to go. So she's trying to emotionally blackmail him, basically, which I think is, is great. And eventually she gets her way and she goes to court. But the men around her have already been in cahoots and they've decided that a really nice way to sidestep the whole situation would be just to marry her off again to another husband. And then they could forget the whole jointure issue and she'd be safely secure with another husband and it would all be great. So she comes to court and they say, hey, you're going to marry Thomas Seymour. Um, the same Thomas Seymour that Catherine Parr later marries. It's all arranged. It'll be great. You'll love it. Mary says, not on your Nelly, are you mad? And goes back to Norfolk, just, just leaves. And I think her father is kind of left making apologies for her. Uh, but she gets away with it. She refuses the marriage. This is at age 17, defying not only her father, but the king as well. And she does get away with it. Mary never remarries. So, yes, sometimes women were able to set their own agendas. Uh, Mary's also quite famous for taking up the evangelical religion quite strongly, again, in opposition to her father, who's quite a strong religious conservative. She hires John Fox, who wrote the Book of Martyrs. He's, he's very strong, what would later become known as Protestant. And he writes that book while in her household in the 1550s, while her father is in prison in the Tower of London during the reign of Edward VI. The first thing that her father Norfolk does when he's released in 1554 is to sack Fox. Uh, and I just wish I'd been a fly on the wall for the fight that surely ensued. Oh, she sounds like a fascinating woman. I have to read up on her more. I haven't done very much work on her at all. That's amazing. So, Nikki, are there any other books in the pipeline for you? Uh, hopefully, yes. 
uh, yeah, I'm I'm trying to put something together at the moment uh, on ladies in waiting on oh, some of the women yeah. who served Henry VIII's wives because I I just think they're there everywhere. They're in every novel, every TV series, and they're like a tidy little backdrop, aren't they, behind the Queen? And occasionally we see a little bit of character, but you know we expect to see them there, but we don't really know what they were doing or why, or, or who they were or any of that. Um, and it's because the archival material is not as straightforward as it is for Mary and Elizabeth. Um, so you do have to kind of read between the lines and, and pick things out and spend a lot of time in the archive. Uh, but I think there are some really interesting things to say about being a lady in waiting during that period with such a fast turnover of queens. Uh, so yeah, that, that's my current project. That sounds amazing. And yeah, they definitely have to be flexible, don't they? Because they <laughs> they kind of went from one consort to the next. And, you know, there's there's a lot of overlapping in the ladies in waiting from Catherine to Anne to, you know, all the rest of them. So that sounds really intriguing. I look forward to reading that. Uh, so the last thing that we do on, well, second last thing, actually, on Talking Tudors is we play a little game of 10 to go. So these are just some questions just to get to know you a little bit better. So are you ready for that? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so we'll start very easy. What's the last book that you read? Oh, good question. I <laughs> am an inveterate, uh, someone who dips in and out of books a lot. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, what's the last entire book that I read? Oh, do you know, I actually reread uh, Judith Kerr, When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit. Um, okay. She's the author of When the Tiger Came to Tea, The Tiger Who Came to Tea, the, the well-known children's book. Yeah. But she also wrote some uh, autobiographical novels about her time escaping from uh, what became Nazi Germany, and they're awesome. And I read them as a child, uh, came across them the other day, and reread those. Wonderful. And speaking of um, children and childhood, what uh, when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Ha, believe it or not, I wanted to be a writer. Oh, I wanted to be an author, and I said that from the age of about seven. Um, so there we go. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. And do you have any writing rituals? Oh, not rituals per se. I think it's really easy to get caught up in. I can only write yes. if I'm in this space and it's dark and, you know, and, and particular things. But actually, when you're down to the wire and it just needs to be done, you will write anywhere. <laughs> Something I do tend to do is um, tailor my location to the kind of writing I'm doing. So if I'm writing something that's really kind of formal academic stuff for a journal or something like that, then yes, I might work in a nice quiet library. But if I'm writing something for a more general audience uh, to teach or give a talk or something like that, I quite like to write in a less formal space. So I'll go sit in a cafe because there's something about hearing the voices around me that puts me in the right frame of mind uh, to, to get that tone into my writing. So what, what's a movie that you've watched that has made you cry? This is really sad, but the original BBC version of Sense and Sensibility with Kate oh. Winslet and Emma Thompson in it invariably always makes me cry uh, but it's not it's not the um it's not Marianne and Willoughby although that's kind of sad it's the it, there's a particular scene in it where Marianne has got some horrible flu-like thing it's never really specified yeah. and it's the middle of the night and the older sister Eleanor is sat by her bedside and suddenly Eleanor who is sense and never gives way and always does the right thing and the sensible thing suddenly just kind of loses it and says oh god don't leave me don't die don't die I'm an older sister and that gets me every time yeah yeah and and hopefully you know we'll be able to travel again in the near future so what's a place that's on your kind of bucket list to visit oh that's a great question uh I have always wanted this again this is this is weird I've always wanted to go to Alaska ever since I read White Fang as a child yeah that would be cool I would much that rather would cool. go somewhere cold than hot do you have a, or are you known for a signature recipe? No, I'm known for <laughs> don't let her cook. It's not a good idea. Uh, no, that's probably an exaggeration. I'm not the best cook in the world. Um, a signature recipe? Not particularly, to be honest. That's all right. That's okay. <laughs> and, and what do you do to recharge the batteries? Uh, I'm a knitter. Oh. Um, I knit toy animals. I knit anything, really. Um, but I mean, anything crafty, anything I can do with my hands uh, or anything musical. Those are my recharge things. Do you do any embroidery like our Tudor women? I do. I do some black work, actually. Oh, wow. Oh, I'd love to learn that. That's that's on my list. Um, name someone that you'd like to sit next to on your next long haul flight. 
Oh. Anyone. It can be any period. We'll just pretend that we can kind of transport them. Transport them. Oh, if we're going. Oh, if we're going historical. Who would I like to meet? I'd really like to sit next to Catherine of Aragon. <laughs> yes, I that just, would be interesting. Have wouldn't many it? sensible things I could learn. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And what is your drink of choice if someone's taking you out? Oh, let's think. What would I drink? Depends. During the day, probably coffee, probably mocha, ideally yeah. from Starbucks. Uh, in the evening, evening that, that might morph to pink gin tonic. Yeah, yum. That sounds good. And <laughs> lucky last, what's a, a really great piece of advice that you've been given at some point that you'd be willing to share with us? Oh, good piece of advice. Behave as though you're confident and people will fall in line with it. And I said that was the second last thing. So the very last thing I ask all my guests is for a Tudor takeaway. So this is something for our listeners to explore after the episode. You know, it could be a, a book recommendation or a film or a song to listen to. Do you have a Tudor takeaway? I do. It's actually a website. Oh, great. Yes. Um, and it's a historical source. So Henry the Seventh and Henry the Eighth kept um, books of expenses for their chamber. And they're called the Tudor Chamber Books. And they list all the payments that were made. So it's to people for taking messages. Wages are in there. I think Henry VII at one point paid an exorbitant sum of money for a young maiden who danced. Which does make you wonder quite what kind of dancing yes. we're talking about. Uh, it's all that kind of stuff. And they have been digitised and put online. And it's amazing. Um, there is, I don't know if you can see the original images but you can see a transcription of the original spelling and then a modernized transcription as well uh, and if you just google tudor chamber books you'll come up with the website and it's just it's amazing just to explore fantastic that's an excellent takeaway and i'll add the the link to that in our show notes so that it's nice and easy for everyone to find and i don't know if it's you know very nerdy of me but i absolutely love going through those accounts <laughs> Books. Oh yeah, and, absolutely. You know, as you say, it just gives you such an insight into their, especially the, the like the privy purse expenses and that kind of thing. Just an insight into their personality, and the, it's so you know revealing. So that's a fantastic takeaway. And Nikki, thank you so much for taking the time to talk tutors with us. It's been really fantastic. Thanks for having me. It's been really fun. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Music